December 1941. War has been raging for more than two years, with the forces of Nazi Germany setting Europe, Russia and North Africa ablaze. In the Far East, British and Australian top brass have long feared hostility from an aggressively expansionist Japan, their former First World War ally, whose forces have already ravaged much of China. Yet here, at the tip of the Malay Peninsula, was our shield against any such strike. The military base that would become known as Fortress Singapore. The so-called Singapore strategy revolved around fortifying the island city as a base for the mighty British Navy to dominate the surrounding area. And, the theory went, it would be impregnable to attack from sea thanks to its garrison of troops from all around the empire and a string of heavy artillery coastal strongpoints, such as this one at Fort Pasir Panjang. Not all military minds thought this strategy was sound. Tragically, those who warned against it would be proved right in one of the greatest defeats ever suffered by Britain. Caught up in the middle of that disaster were more than 15,000 Australian soldiers. To fully understand their story, we must first head north to the Thai-Malay border, where, on December the 8th, one hour before the infamous Japanese airstrike on America's Pearl Harbor, hell was unleashed. The entire world remembers Pearl Harbor, which marked Japan's entry into the war and dragged the US with it. But as bombs fell in Hawaii, seaborne Japanese troops also poured ashore in Northeast Malaya and in Thailand. Despite fierce resistance by Aussie air crews, Indian infantry and British artillery, the Allies were soon in retreat down the Malay Peninsula as the enemy poured along both its east and west coasts. The reality of the fast-moving, capable Japanese troops was very different to what the Aussies and Brits had been told to expect. Allied propaganda that had painted the enemy as poorly equipped, short-sighted weaklings was soon shown up to be about as reliable as our intelligence and command structure, riddled with flaws. However, there was no lack of courage among individual soldiers, and Australians were engaged in notable actions to hold up the enemy. At Gemenshe Bridge, near Gamas, bike-riding Japanese troops were mown down in a deadly Aussie ambush that raised hopes the Allies might yet halt the advance. Another stunning success followed 80 kilometers south on the road between Moi and Bakri, where Australian gunners firing at close range knocked out nine Japanese tanks. The reprieve was only temporary. The Allies had lost air superiority and the retreat continued. And it was now that the brutality of the Japanese truly emerged at a river village called Parrot Sulong where 163 wounded Australian and Indian soldiers were captured, tormented, and then grotesquely executed. 54 days after the Japanese landings, on January 31st, the Allies pulled back to Singapore Island, blowing the causeway behind them. The enemy gathered across the strait in Johor, preparing for the next step. The defenders outnumbered their foe around two to one, but Allied Commander General Arthur Percival did not know this. Japanese Commander Tomiyuki Yamashita would later acknowledge his attack on Singapore was a successful bluff, adding, I knew that if I had to fight for long for Singapore, I would be beaten. Yamashita began that final onslaught on the evening of February the 8th with a waterborne assault on the Australian positions directly below us. Australians were dug in around the beaches and marshy inlets on the northwest coast of the island. The 22nd Brigade, positioned around Sarambun, were first subjected to a massively intense artillery barrage. Then, through the darkness, they began to see motorboats and landing barges appear. The Australians opened up with rifles and machine guns. 
but there were just 3,000 of them spread out over several kilometers. And there were 13,000 Japanese in the first wave alone, with more to come. It was not long before some of our units were overwhelmed and the enemy, using the cover of darkness, the terrain and the vegetation, began to infiltrate through the rest of our lines. It was the same all along this part of the coastline. Top Brass had expected the attack to come over to the northeast and had positioned the bulk of their British and Indian forces accordingly, leaving the Australians here outmanned and outmaneuvered. It was a disaster. By achieving shock and numerical superiority at one key point, the Japanese were through the defences and onto the island fortress, even landing tanks. The Allies began a fighting retreat towards the city in the direction we're travelling now. There were moments of outstanding bravery and combat skill by individual soldiers of all nations, but leadership and communications were chaotic. The enemy advance was relentless and brutal. They took few prisoners and even murdered around 250 unarmed, wounded men, doctors and nurses when they overran the Alexandra Hospital. That battle ended here, in a sense. This is Fort Canning, known today as the Battle Box, and it was the Allied headquarters. In that final desperate week, the news coming in here was all bad. Military and civilian casualties were mounting. The city's water supply was faltering. An order was breaking down. In less disciplined army units, there were cases of desertion and looting. Winston Churchill urged General Percival to use his superior numbers to strike one more decisive blow. But on February the 15th, 1942, Percival chose to surrender. With that, the guns fell silent but the horror was far from over. As the Japanese occupied Singapore, civilians were treated with savage brutality, especially Japan's old foe, the Chinese, thousands of whom were executed. While the exact figure will never be known, historians estimate between 25 and 55,000 ethnic Chinese were massacred during the occupation of Singapore and Malaya. Even for those who escaped the city, horror could follow. In the weeks leading to the surrender, thousands were evacuated from the Singapore docks. Now, that evacuation was dogged by controversy. With accusations some well-connected civilians had taken so much luggage, there wasn't room for others in need. One of the most controversial escapees was our own General Gordon Bennett, who, upon news of the surrender, handed over command of the Australian forces to his deputy and fled in a small boat. Among the last ships to leave was the Viner Brook, carrying 65 Australian Army nurses, as well as wounded soldiers and civilians. It was sunk in an air raid two days later. Around 82 survivors who made it to shore on nearby Banker Island were murdered by the Japanese including 21 of the nurses infamously machine gunned in the surf. Just one, Vivian Bullwinkle, survived. The name most synonymous with the fall of Singapore is Changi. It's the prison and barracks where most of the 85,000 allies captured on the island, among them 15,000 Australians, were held after the surrender. Another 40,000 allies had been captured in Malaya. While Changi was a site of great suffering, far worse was to befall POWs sent to labour at places like the Death Railway and Sandakan. You can explore those chapters in depth in other Anzac 360 episodes. For those that survived such horrors, returning to Changi was by contrast a welcome relief. The fall of Singapore was a disaster. Many have been blamed since, from top brass to ordinary soldiers but finger pointing does not alter the facts. The island remained occupied by Japan until the war's end, although there were various allied raids on the Japanese shipping there, including the famous Australian operations Jaywick and Rimau. While the city was returned to Britain for a time, the events of 1942 marked the beginning of the end of Britain's imperial role in Asia and had a considerable impact on Australia's post-war position in the world. 
nothing would be the same again, lest we forget. <laughs>